thinking about how we can all make a difference for a more positive climate and for a sustainable future for all. So let me introduce a little bit about Peace Boat US as we are here in our building. We have an office here on the third floor. Peace Boat works as a vessel sailing the world, promoting a culture of peace and sustainability around the world. You'll see here on the left-hand side, this is our eco ship. I just wanna draw attention. This is our vessel of the future. We are working to sail as a flagship for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals using solar and wind power. And we hope that all of you will be able to join us on board this ship on our next voyage. So we've been working in collaboration with our partner organization, Peace Boat, which is based in Japan. Where I also lived in Japan for around 10 years working in the international division there. And that is where our headquarters is based, organizing these global voyages on board our passenger ship, which travels the world. And we carry the SDGs logo on the hull of the ship. Peace Boat also has special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. So we, that is why we are based here also in the UN Plaza. We work very closely with many of our UN partners. And today is also an official side event of the United Nations High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, focused on SDG 4 for quality education. And Peace Boat works on education through all of our international programs. We have programs focused on the SDGs and we've even started a Youth for the SDG Scholarship which is for young people ages 18 to 30. Raise your hand if you're in that age range here today, 18 to 30. I think most of you guys. Okay, we have some younger. How about 16 to 30? Raise your hands. All right. We have quite a lot of young people here, so we're really excited to introduce some of our programs to you and hope that you can join us in the future. So one of the programs that we organize is our Ocean and Climate Youth Ambassador Program, and we actually have one of those youth here today. Uh, Leticia Parkinson, can you raise your hand in the back here from Trinidad and Tobago? Give her a round of applause. Our Ocean and Climate Youth Ambassador Program welcomes young people from small island developing states or large ocean states who are really on the front lines of climate and ocean degradation to join us on board the ship and to share their experiences and best practices together doing events on board that involve capacity training, and also sharing their message with government and civil society representatives. Our youth have presented at a number of international fora, including the UN Climate Change Conferences, and our offices here in this building have been a headquarters for those youth to come back and be interns with us, to participate in UN events, and we're just really excited to have so many people joining us here today in the conference room, and also for those of you who are tuning in live on Zoom. So we're welcoming our interns who are also here at Peace Boat. Raise your hand one more time if you're interning with Peace Boat US. We have some interns here. Thank you so much for being here, for supporting. So this will also end up uh, as a report online. So our interns will be taking photos. And we have our photographer, Sasha, who's here with us. Uh, so we'll be doing a group photo uh, at the end. So please stay around and join us. One other thing about Peace Boat is that we are excited to be hosting this in partnership, of course, with so many of you who are here from different organizations, but in particular with the Global Center on Adaptation. The forum today is aimed at ensuring that youth voices from the region are present, heard, and considered in climate change adoption, adaptation agenda, including their view on the global goal on adaptation. As we hear the global goal on adaptation is the first collective commitment to enhancing adaptive capacity, strengthening resilience, and reducing vulnerability to climate change, and that was established by the Paris Agreement. As we know, this is also an event of the UNHLPF, which we mentioned. And this year, the High Level Political Forum is focused on SDG 4 for quality education, which is in review this year, SDG 13 for climate action. And also working on the event today is part of building up your skills on the SDGs. Today is the Youth Skills Day of the United Nations, and we really hope that you will gain these skills while you're meeting people here, while you're learning about the goals and that you will gain something important that will help you with your future working towards sustainability. So we'd like to start out today also um, by giving the floor to one of our partners here online, to Adriana Valenzuela. Adriana is the thematic lead for the Youth Leadership and Education at the Global Center on Adaptation. And she's unable to be here in New York, but she is online, so we're very excited to have her here. Welcome, Adriana, everybody see her there on the screen? Give her a round of applause, everyone. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Emily. And I'm very glad to see you 
all there in New York, and it demonstrates the power of the connection between people, between countries, between organizations. Um, as I mentioned, I lead the youth leadership and education program at the Global Center on Adaptation. Uh, GCA is an international organization that was established as a solution broker to establish partnership with governments, civil society organizations, UN agencies, youth organizations and communities to accelerate adaptation action. And today is a day to celebrate. It's a day to celebrate the World Youth Skills Day, but especially the passion, the energy and the commitment of young people leading transformation in their communities. As part of the program of youth leadership, we have multiple initiatives to empower youth and to make them uh, agents of change. We establish the Youth Adaptation Network, and currently we have members in over 130 countries as a platform to connect youth and youth organizations and facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange. Also, we created the last year the Youth Adaptation Panel uh, that provides advice to our CEO on how we can accelerate adaptation action and how we can empower youth as uh, these key players in the adaptation agenda. And this year we are doing a mobilization. We are building and strengthening the adaptation youth movement. In March, we started organizing the youth adaptation forums, bringing together young people from all over the world with decision makers. The first adaptation uh, forum took place in, uh, in March as part of the World Water Forum in Senegal. And we have every month one um, youth adaptation forum. Today, we are really delighted and thankful to our partner Peaceboat and all the other organizations and groups that have been uh, engaged in this process to organize the North America Youth Adaptation Forum. It is the fifth one. There are two more coming. The next one will be MENA for, um, on the 3rd of August, and we will close the process with the Latin America Youth Forum on the 12th of August. All these ideas and recommendations also will be uh, brought to a global uh, summit that will be taking place in September. And the ideas of recommendations are uh, going to be presented to different decision makers. For instance, at the COP27 that this year will take place in Egypt, but as well in other international scenarios. And what is the main objective of these youth adaptation forums? The voices of young people, the experience and the recommendations are crucial. Today, uh, I wanted to share with you three key points. One, where are we? The second point is, what do we need? And the third one is, what is your role? Then where are we? Currently, we are um, as part of the global crisis and climate change is one of the defining issues of our time. And also uh, we have uh, advanced with the intergovernmental process, governments adopted the Paris Agreement on Climate Change that is this universal agreement and recognized as part of the Article 12, the key role that education, training and public awareness play to empower people to be part of the solution. But also the same year in 2015, there in New York where you are, governments adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goal number 13 is related to climate action. And the Sustainable Development Goal number four is about quality education. And today, as part of the International Youth Skill Day, the key message uh, that is connected about what do we need? We need to invest in education. We need to invest in the skills development. And we need to empower not only the young generations, but every person in the world to be part of the solution. And adapt what is adaptation? Adaptation is this capacity that people and the communities have to adapt to the impacts of climate change. It's about increasing resilience and it's a topic for all countries. It's not only about the global south, it's about people suffering the impacts of climate change. And it's also just connected to my third point about your role. At the beginning, you have this very sparring performance saying that you are the champions and you have the power 
to change the world. And I think what we need is that every person take part in this transformation. We need access to information. We need to raise awareness in the communities. We need to develop skills to know how we can prepare according to the local circumstances and needs to the impacts of climate change. And we need to establish partnerships. No anyone alone can do it. No governments, no organizations. For that, we need to work together. And these ideas are, uh, uh, that you are going to discuss today, these good practices, are an inspiration also to governments about what they can do as part of the global goal on adaptation that is part of the intergovernmental process. There is a global goal on mitigation, uh, but now governments are discussing what do we need as part of the global goal on adaptation. Your ideas and recommendations will help to shape this process. Then I just wanted to finalize with a special recognition, not only to the young um, people in the room in New York, the other that are following this uh, event in, uh, through the online connection, but especially to every young person that daily is working to make a transformation. And especially these ones that are working with their communities to build climate resilience. Then thank you very much to everyone. And then I think today we have an excellent agenda full of inspiration and full of also ideas about how we can work together. And the most important, how we can build together a North America climate resilient development. Then thank you very much and over to you, Emily. It has been such a pleasure organizing this forum with you, but also having you on board the Peace Boat back in 2018, working with you at the COP and so many other international conferences. Everyone, you will definitely see Adriana around when you go to the next international conference or UN related event. So please, Keep an eye out for her. Thank you so much for all your support. One more round of applause, everybody. For having you on the Great. So next, we'll also be hearing uh, from Dr. Patrick Vergoyen, who is the CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation and Professor of Practice of Sustainable Development Diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. So we'll be pulling up his video message, as he's also not able to be here today, uh, but he'll be sharing a message with us uh, via Zoom. So excited to be working with this Center of Global Adaptation, mostly because of their focus uh, on supporting youth, but also all their incredible programs that they're running around the world. So we'll just give them a moment. Dear friends, welcome to this North American Youth Adaptation Forum, which we are convening with UN High Level political forum and thank you to our wonderful partner Peace Boat for hosting us today. Young people everywhere are putting the climate emergency at the top of the political agenda. You are demanding more ambitious action and rightly so because the science tells us that we need urgent, deep, bold action to avert an impending catastrophe. Mitigating global warming requires an energy revolution of unprecedented scale. But what about the climate impacts that are already posing clear and present dangers? We're living in a time when the climate emergency is already hitting communities across the North American continent. This time last year, Western North America was in the grip of an unprecedented and deadly heat wave. The Canadian town of Lytton, to give you one example, was destroyed by fires only a day after it recorded the highest temperature ever of just under 50 degrees Celsius. Right across the Pacific Northwest and as far south as San Diego, road and rail infrastructure suffered. Businesses closed and crops, crops burned. Losses were estimated at $9 billion at least, and at least 1,400 people died. Mitigation, friends, might at some future point in time prevent these losses. But right now, right here, with more frequent and intense extreme weather events occurring, adaptation is, quite frankly, the only viable response. So while I admire and applaud you for how young people like yourself are raising the alarm on mitigating climate change, 
we badly need you to bring the same energy to calling loud, clear, bold action on adaptation to the changes we see taking place all around us. Only a few days ago, I was in Kenya with President Kenyatta, and I saw at first hand how young people are directly impacted by climate change, but at the same time how simple but effective solutions can change their lives. A sand dam can provide water pumped by solar power for as many as 6,000 families and two schools. And before the dam was built, children had to walk 20 miles to fetch water and that kept them out of class. So it's vital, it's vital that we take adaptation measures to avert the worst impacts of climate change. And that's where the Global Center on Adaptation, or GCA, where we come in. GCA, we are a solutions broker, which is making young people central to adapting the world to the impacts of the climate emergency. We're connecting, but most importantly, we are empowering young people through our youth adaptation network to make the case for adaptation. At this event, at your event today, and at the upcoming Global Youth Adaptation Dialogue in September, we're collecting your perspectives on building towards COP27 in Egypt in November. And when I talk to young people around the world, one message, there's one message, always rings out loud and clear to me. We need more awareness, we need more education, and we need bold action now. Young people across the globe, you care passionately about climate and the fate of our planet. I saw that for myself at the University of Nairobi last week, where we have just launched a landmark project that will brought together expertise from faculties, but also from students to design solutions for climate resilient infrastructure in Kenya. But you, you need knowledge, you need the skills to get involved in making decisions on adaptation policy. Which is why I'm delighted that this year's high-level political forum focuses on sustainable development goal number four, quality education. We have less, we have less than eight years left to complete this ambitious agenda. And we cannot do it without including climate adaptation at every opportunity. I see young entrepreneurs leading adaptation projects in their communities whether it's in Cameroon, whether it's in Zambia, whether it's in Ghana, and more and more countries across the globe. And they are also creating jobs in the process with innovative businesses such as installing climate smart irrigation technology. It saves water, and it's a fight against drought. At the GCA, we aim to unlock 25 billion US dollars for adaptation action in Africa alone. It will grow 10,000 youth-led enterprises in Africa through our Youth ADAPT program. But, colleagues, time is not on our side. The moment to work on adaptation solutions is not tomorrow, is not next month, is not next year, it is now. So let's get on with it. I look forward to working with you all. The more of us that work together, the more potential for change that we can unleash. We need you. Great, thank you so much. That was a beautiful message from all of our partners at the Global Center on Adaptation. And you can see that they're very enthusiastic about us moving the needle forward, staying positive in our action, for climate and looking at what we can actually do and finding solutions, which is very important. And one of the reasons that we're here today. So we'd like to start then with our first panel. We're gonna be inviting some of our panelists to come here to the front and we'll be doing one by one and bringing our panelists also to the mic so that we can speak so that our partners in Zoom can also follow the conversation. Um, so again, we're really grateful uh, for the introduction on, from our partners in the Global Center on Adaptation. And as we introduce this first panel, we'll ask you uh, to come sit at the front and then we have one more message that we'll be sharing with you all as well. 
So first we'd like to start with our panel, which is entitled, The Role of Youth in the Global Goal on Adaptation. We'll begin with an introduction to the Global Goal on Adaptation through the video message of Mr. Youssef Nasset, who is the Director of Adaptation to the UN Climate Change, especially to the, all of the conferences taking place with the UNFCCC. Mr. Nasset possesses over 30 years of experience in diplomacy and international environmental policy, and is the second diplomat from the Egyptian Foreign Service. And we'll be really interested to hear also what's coming up for COP27, which will be taking place in Egypt this year. Um, so we'll be having this video message just before we introduce our panelists, but I'd like to invite the panelists to come up and sit in the front. We have Ms. Alyssa King, who is a student from Stuyvesant High School here in New York City, and a member of the Global Ambassador Program from Blue Planet Alliance. Alyssa, if you'd like to come have a seat at the front. Welcome. We have Ms. Isata Cintron Rodriguez, an a climate scientist from Puerto Rico and representative of the U.S. Action for Climate Empowerment, ACE Coalition. And also Ms. Haley Campbell, who is the Interim Executive Director for Care About Climate and a part of Young Go's Action for Climate Empowerment team. So we'll be letting our panelists also introduce themselves and their work to you. We'll do one by one. But first, let's hear a video message now from Mr. Yusuf Nassif, Director of Adaptation for UN Climate Change. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I'm very happy to be addressing the youth constituency on climate change and on the specific issue of adaptation and on what the global goal on adaptation should entail. Now at the outset, allow me to apologize on behalf of all adults for the situation that we and our predecessors over the past 200 years have put the youth in, in, in this um, strange situation where um, you are the first generation to endure the impacts of climate change, but yet the last generation to be able to solve the problem. And you may recall that the science made its mark in 2018 with the IPCC report on the 1.5 by giving us a very short window of action where we have to transform the way we do our business in order to be able to retain what we consider to be a prosperous life or an acceptable life and we are now in peril of even extinction. Now, how can you help and how can the climate process help with visioning such a desirable future where we do not have to worry about climate change perils or other ecological disasters and on the contrary, move into an abundant, sustainable environment and mindset? Now, you know that our negotiating process has identified goals for mitigation well below 2 degrees, preferably 1.5. We have objectives for funding, the 100 billion, and there would be a new number for 2025. And we are still to articulate what kind of vision we want for adaptation and resilience. And this is really important for us to now get the input from the main stakeholders of the future the youth. What is it that you would like to see in terms of a future mindset that would prioritize resilience, that would prioritize sustainability? It's not just a climate change thing. It's climate change and biodiversity and nature stewardship and equity across the world. How can we do that? We'd like to know how you would define the tenets of such a desirable future. Now, this also reflects what kinds of values do we want to instill in the world? What kind of learning would then make us depart from the standard educational system that prioritizes extractive economies at the expense of regenerative economies? And within the coming two years, we will have a work stream, the Global Goal on Adaptation, where we will have eight different workshops where inputs from all external entities are welcome. And I look forward to the youth constituency presenting very strongly their own input, insights, aspirations, visions to help us take the right decisions internationally and nationally and subnationally 
to move our societies to that aspirational world that guarantees all these positive values that define what it means to be permanently sustainable, to be permanently resilient, to have moved towards that regenerative lifestyle to which we all aspire. Thank you very much. We're so grateful for the introduction to the Global Goal on Adaptation. Thank you to Mr. Yosef Nasser and his team. And thank you for setting the scene for our panel now, which we'll be moving on to with our incredible young female speakers here. Um, so I'd like to just start, first of all, by giving you all about two minutes each, just to introduce yourselves and the work that you're doing. And then we're going to go on to a little bit deeper conversation with a question for each of you. And I'd love to ask you uh, each to please come up to the stage to introduce yourself so everybody on Zoom can also uh, tune in and hear your introductions. So maybe we can start with Haley and then Isatis and then uh, go on to Alyssa with a short self-introduction. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm going to kick it off, kick it off here. It's exciting. Uh, my name is Haley Campbell. As you saw, I'm conveniently wearing the same outfit in my little photo as I am today. So easily recognizable. And I wear a couple of different hats. One of them is I'm actually no longer the interim executive director. I am the executive director of Care About Climate. So exciting. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and what we do there is empower young people to better understand international climate diplomacy from a climate change perspective via the UN climate change processes and helping young people to understand what are the nationally determined contributions and how are young people included or not in these spaces, plus one other option of things that young people care about. So we're here talking about adaptation today and it's awesome to see a lot of our analyses do cover that. So if you're interested, definitely let me know and we're happy to support with that. And that's one thing that I do. Another thing is I'm a volunteer in local government at an office of climate change here in the United States. And I work a lot on our climate adaptation team and equitable community engagement. So we're trying to rethink not just how we are engaging our communities generally on climate adaptation, but it's also about our schools, our families, our older generations, our grandparents as well. It's how we're, in, in, how we're engaging every single person in these conversations because climate adaptation is really important for the most vulnerable, but that includes not just people in the global South, but also includes our most vulnerable people in the global north as well. And I am living in Hawaii where we are incredibly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change every day. So it's really been an amazing experience to be able to learn and grow there. And I'm happy to be able to share a bit more about that with you later. And lastly, as mentioned, I'm also part of the youth constituency of UN Climate Change, UNFCCC. And this is a global network of young people that come together to advocate for different perspectives and points and youth inclusion at the UN climate change processes. So if you're interested in any of this, let me know, happy to connect afterwards and I'll leave my intro at that, yeah. Great, thank you Haley, thank you so much for that intro. And next up we have Isatis. All right, hello everyone. My name is Isabel Cintron. I am from Puerto Rico. I'm a climate scientist. Um, I study the chemical transport of pollutants to glaciers, um, but I also believe that what starts in ice ends in water. So that's why I'm super interested in climate change and affecting the solution because I come from Puerto Rico. And then um, there I have an organization that's called Climate Trace. And we work in empowering individuals and creating new spaces for um, people to talk about um, climate strategies, et cetera. I also am the regional coordinator for Latin America for an organization that's called Citizens Climate International. And there we work also with um, helping individuals to influence decision making. Um, and here I carry the same agenda in US providing um, technical advice to governments and also organizations. So I'm super happy to be here. Super happy to see you all here. So um, be looking forward to chat with you more. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Alyssa Kay and I'm a rising sophomore at Cyberson High School. Um, I'm here on behalf of Blue Planet Alliance as an ambassador 
um, an organization working <laughs> to bring renewable energy to the world. Um, our mission is to collaborate with various corporations, governments, and individuals to bring 100% renewable energy to countries all around the world. Um, our goal is to have a commitment of 100% renewable energy by 2045. So far, our work in Hawaii has been successful as the 100% renewable energy mandate is currently being implemented. Um, so far, we have brought this vision to New York and we are working with ambassadors in Palau and Guam, as well as New York, to provide 100% renewable energy. Um, as ambassadors, we specifically focus on SDGs 7 and 13, and I'm excited to talk to you all about youth development. Right. Thank you very much, ladies. It's great to hear all the incredible work you're doing. They play many roles, as you can see. So don't ever think that you're going to be growing up to do one particular job. I myself with Peace Boat play many roles, as you can see, even today, organizing and emceeing and doing different things. It's really important to be flexible and to adapt to your climate. All right. So <laughs> with our first uh, panel, we'd like to kind of jump in and um, start with a few questions, um, just to get warmed up a little bit. We're going to start with Alyssa, and we'd like to ask you, if you can set the scene for us here in North America, what climate change impacts do you face in North America in general, or even here in this region on the Eastern Coast? Um, so every year we hear news and records being broken about the hottest temperatures, the coldest temperatures, and clearly from these headlines, we see that the weather around us is becoming more and more unpredictable year by year. Um, and some examples in recent years is in 2020, um, around 4.2 million acres of land in California were subject to wildfires. And these wildfires are as a result of high temperatures and severe droughts that lead to increased risks of wires spreading. Um, and these fires spreading not only lead to a devastating loss of land, um, but a lot of human health is impacted. Um, as these fires are being burned and trees are falling, um, a lot of CO2 is being released, which we know are greenhouse gases that will contribute even more to the current climate crisis. But also the ash from these events um, can cause mild to severe disorders um, that affect not only youth, but adults as well. And these leave a significant impact on the communities around the areas, 4.2 million acres. Um, so that's a lot of land. Um, another instance is um, Hurricane Sandy, um, I believe a few years ago um, in New York. I was just four back then, but it was a really bad hurricane um, and there were um, significant losses in that. Um, and so as we can see from these natural disasters, we see that hurricanes are on the rise. And as a result, um, a lot of loss of life will follow and they will continue to worsen unless something will be done. Um, but I believe that's what we're all here for today and what a lot of the youth here are for today. Um, we have our voices and we are able to unite as one, as you guys typically hear, and we have become more resilient than ever. Um, and I do believe that we hold the power to create new legislation, to work with pol politicians around us, to build um, better plans that will address our current Thank you. Great, thank you, Alyssa. And yes, so many different, you know, fire storms, like you mentioned, um, the hurricane, so many different things that we're seeing as the effects of climate change and increasing temperatures worldwide. So thank you for mentioning a few of those and just setting the scene a little bit. And now thinking about all of those changes, I want to ask actually Haley to come up. Since you have direct experience in the field of policy and adaptation and building an equitable climate adaptation strategy for Honolulu's Municipal Climate Change Office, what challenges do you face in your region and um, how do you participate in adaptation policy and action in North America? That is a really, really great question, especially you know, as a young person, it can be really hard 
to engage any type of policy. So I'm actually part of the AmeriCorps program. And while I don't represent them, I don't represent the government, I do have to say that. These are just my personal opinions from my experience there. But it's been a really great opportunity to learn more about climate adaptation from one of the only offices in the US, global offices, that has a team dedicated to climate adaptation, which is, of course, makes sense for Hawaii, a place, again, really, really vulnerable and possibly one of the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change in the United States. And so it's really, really great to see that. But from my experience, I can share a little bit about that. First today, um, just now actually from the CEO of the GCA, we did hear the need for education and awareness raising on adaptation. A lot of times what we're talking about is mitigation and trying to stop our emissions, but ultimately we haven't done enough to make sure that we're not going to see impacts. For example, just this past week, we had the king tides in Hawaii which happens a couple times a year. And these are instances of really high tides that happen every, it happens every year, uh, but they're a kind of a snapshot a glimpse of what you might see in the future as sea levels rise, for instance. So this one's where I think 2.69 feet and already on the main beaches, you can see the amount of space you usually can sit on, very small stairs were completely covered by the sea level rise that was happening during these tides. And that's only at 2.69 feet when we're predicted to have anywhere from three to six feet of sea level rise. So it's not just gonna be beaches that are being impacted with people's ability to sit, but it's people's homes, it's people's culture. A lot of Hawaiian culture is tied, especially to the ocean. So it's, you know, we're thinking about adaptation, it's important to remember, it's not just, can I enjoy the beach and go sit and relax? It's, can I still practice my culture, my community and my way of life as it's tied to the ocean? So a couple other things from today is it's also, World Youth Skills Day, I think I got the acronym right. And what we learned, I was there this morning for that, and what we learned today is that we really need to transform our education and career systems to focus on including young people more, not just in shaping new programs, but also as leaders and listening to them and we're invited into these green jobs, hopefully, right? Actually having the chance to create these changes that we want to see. So I guess a little bit more about my experience, right? This year, I accepted this one-year position for AmeriCorps, and I was charged with doing equitable community engagement, but they gave me no money to do so. Well, okay, we can work with it. So I ended up applying to a grant, which is really amazing from an organization, and they gave us the funding to be able to partner with the community-based organization. And through that community-based organization, we went to the frontline communities instead of trying to do only virtual or trying to do outreach just ourselves, and went to these community-based orgs to find and do outreach to communities. So what did a kind of typical day look like at these events? One, back to education and awareness raising, it's about being creative, but also about making sure when you're talking about climate change, you're relating it to people's personal experiences and something that can be easily understood, right? These can be really technical terms and the science can be scary and overwhelming to see, oh, the whole beach could be gone in 30 years, what? It's very overwhelming stuff to think about. So I ended up creating two climate adaptation games for community engagement one on extreme heat and one on sea level rise. And they are unique to Hawaii, but they take people on a journey of trying to adapt to climate change by implementing solutions. So it's a solution oriented game. And for people to participate, they brought, it was a young person, brought a family member. So we had this intergenerational aspect of these events to make sure that adaptation is moving beyond people right now, like young people who don't really have the resources and the space to necessarily make the changes. For, you know, our homes installing, you know, hurricane proof, um, you know, windows and roofs, right? That's not really a decision a kid usually makes, but it's something our parents can make and something that they need to also be brought in on. So it was really awesome to have this intergenerational aspect, but also see grandparents and parents be really proud of their kid for stepping up into a space. And as a result, there are schools that now want to have these games and we're trying to publish them on the website and all these cool things. So maybe you can... Uh, stay uh, up to date on seeing that maybe in the future, but kind of close out this question is we really heard today a need to be creative, be solutions oriented, and really engage and partner with young people, right? Not just kind of talking to them one time. So to wrap it up, we are now trying to launch a community champions program to actually inspire and create the capacity for people to be adaptation kind of ambassadors or champions who can go into their communities with government support and try to hopefully 
empower their community members because there's nothing like your neighbor telling you, hey, I'm doing this for climate adaptation, you can do it too, then that's gonna excite you more than to have it like that. So I think it's really coming down to education, awareness raising and trying to do it intergenerationally together because that is how we're going to create the solutions that we need to thrive in the face of the changing climate. Thank you. Great, thank you, Haley. And I really love that intergenerational um, aspect, which is really important because we do need everybody involved, all the stakeholders and everyone at the table, right? So that's really important to involve families as well as you know parents and decision makers. Um, and next up, I'd like to invite Isatis because you, like Haley, also have a lot of experience with the action um, agenda and also looking at the Action for Climate Empowerment ACE agenda as well. And what are the youth priorities in North America that you think for the global goal on adaptation and the interconnection with the Action for Climate Empowerment ACE agenda? Everybody welcome, Isatis. All right, not a small question. So let's start maybe by explaining what ACE is, um, for those of you who might not know. ACE is part of the Paris Agreement. It's part of the Article um, uh, 12 of the Paris Agreement that recognizes the importance to have an informed and activated society. And these are through six pillars and they are education, public participation, access to information, public awareness, um, and international um, cooperation. I think I'm forgetting one, um, which is access to information, maybe? Yeah, access access to access information. To yes, thank you, Haley. Um, yes, so, well, normally it's like a long list, a long laundry list of um, things that we need to work on, but like in order for us to really develop the strategies, like. These, are, these need to be all working together. So we have heard from the IPCC that the window for keeping 1.5 alive is narrowing. And, uh, and that means that that is our opportunity to, to be able to adapt. So um, we have the chance to do this, but while the technical conversations have been a little bit slow, a little bit it's an understatement, but um, they have been a little bit slow, we have seen that youth and local communities have been forced to mobilize themselves to adapt to the extreme weather events that they are facing as a means of survival. Um, so there is no other way. Um, we often look outwards, right? Like we look at um, least developed countries, we look at the Pacific Islands, um, but recently uh, there was this climate risk index that was published and actually Puerto Rico is leading, is leading um, the weather related losses from 2000 to 2019. So it's no country like across the ocean, it's not so far, it's like here under like our like North America kind of like weird relationship with um, Puerto Rico. So we need to we need to really prioritize. Obviously, we need to prioritize like least developed uh, countries. We need to prioritize Pacific Island, other small island, um, small developing island states. But we need to also recognize ourselves as part of um, actors and um, recognize the communities that are in need within North America to. Um, the irony of adaptation. Um, so what do we do? So um, when, when I look, when I think about adaptation, I really don't look at negotiators. I really don't look at governments. I look at people. I look at the power of community that is the greatest capital that we have. I look at um, Sami that is, um, that she is like, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the word in Spanish. She is um, raising coral reefs to protect and like rebuild the coastal barriers of Puerto Rico. I looked at Maria that is um, growing our land to increase the uh, food security of the island. I also looked at Jose that is working into developing community aqueducts to try to bring um, food and um, water access 
into more communities. So these are the people that we need to be talking about. So um, it all comes back to AIDS, right? It all comes back to have people that are aware, educated, but I think education for what? Like we need to be educated in order to be able to act. Like we need to have the access to not only influence decision-making, but also be partners and be, um, you know, taking into account when we are doing these strategies and implementing them, et cetera. So, so what do we need? So we need to ensure that the global goal on adaptation serves as a North Star. So this North Star needs to really um, carry it out like, okay, like where does the funding need to be going? Um, and what do we need to prioritize? But really like the goals of adaptation need to be more um, based on local context. So we need to have those conversations. We need to have this conversation with the people here, with the people in the communities. So we need those spaces to be, um, be brought into realization in, in order for them to be um, gender responsive, in order for them to be intersectional and then to be intergenerational. So those spaces sometimes exist, but they exist in an ad hoc way. Like for example, um, in Puerto Rico, um, the Citizens Assembly for Climate Action. It is led um, by my organization. And what we do is like we bring together people to talk about like what is the climate strategy that we want to see in Puerto Rico. And from that, what we have heard from communities that we want to have known only something that leads the country um, vision, but that also have like more of the centralized aspect of it so that each community can really identify what are their needs and how can they implement that in partnership with the um, local um, municipalities and like other like sectors, et cetera. So, so first we need to have those spaces for social innovation and those need to be really um, participatory. And then we also need um, to uplift and elevate existing, existing initiatives. Um, so there is uh, this project called the AIDS Observatory that kind of looks to assess like how countries and local governments are really looking at um, implementing strategies that are participatory that includes youth um, in decision making as well that create skills to ensure um, youth, local communities and indigenous people have access to sustainable career paths um, that can support adaptation efforts protecting their communities. And finally, we need support. I think that we have heard that we have a lot of projects and some of them um, sometimes like a little bit of um, support in terms of financing. I think that a lot of you here might have find themselves like in this passion to do more work, but you need to be in power, you need to be in a position, you need to give the two, you need to be given the tools in order to lead. So you don't need to be taught to only skills, but like given the tools to come with the rest of the world together. So, you know, I've heard like so many times in, inside of like negotiation spaces, it's like, oh, the youth are calling for bold action. They inspire us so much. It's like, great, we want to also lead. So we need to make sure that that global goal of adaptation really focuses on um, giving those resources where they're needed um, because we need to scale up like those successful youth projects. Um, the rest of our lives are going to be dominated by climate change. So we need to start investing like it is. So thank you so much um, for having me here. <laughs> Thank you, Sazis. It's so great to have your knowledge, especially with all the young people here and how they can get involved in ACE and how they can get involved in all the climate action projects that you're a part of. So very excited to have all of you here. And we have one last question for the panel. Um, we will ask you to come up to the mic one more time and just to share what you think, um, really what, in your opinion, from governments, from education to society, what do young people need to participate fully and meaningfully in policymaking? because we know there's a big need, right? And I know a lot of you in the audience probably have ideas about this too. Um, but let's start with Alyssa. Yeah, what do you think young people need to get involved in policymaking? And then you can just come up one after the other and share your experiences. 
Um, in order to make change, I think governments and society as a whole need to begin listening to youth um, and understanding that their ideas, although they may not be mature yet, they're still able to be developed into legislation or policies that can be implemented. Um, standing from an education standpoint, I think it's important for all schools to start having holistic education about climate change. Um, not only addressing that climate change is something that's caused by greenhouse gases, CO2, a lot of us already know that, but rather what are the economic impacts of climate change or how economics impacts climate change and all the various sectors that impact climate change that a lot of us don't know about. Um, personally for me, um, when I was younger, I didn't even know climate change was a thing. Um, so once I did learn that climate change was caused by, you know, burning fossil fuels and stuff, I was wondering, so what can we do? Um, and for me, it took a lot of research and learning um, to, to come to the conclusion that there are a lot of things that go into climate change and it's a more complicated issue than a lot of youth know. Um, so I think that, that education needs to start addressing these issues and providing more information as to what they can do and what needs to be done. Right, I think I mostly said it, um, but I think that when we talk about like how youth can get involved, I think that we need to have our governments that are able to listen, but that also make space. We don't want to only have forums like where youth is like um, like an interesting an interest stakeholder. We want to have the stakeholder be part of the table. So we want to make sure that um, when we're including youth, like we're giving um, legitimate spaces for them to bring the ideas to the table and influence how decision making is being made, a part of like actually supporting their actions. So I think that, yes, like um, clear leadership support. And we have seen uh, a lot of countries that actually include um, in their teams um, youth, like both at the international and at the national level. And that really creates a different perspective and in the way that they speak, um, the perspective that they bring to the table, um, you can see that is really influencing how a country moves. It's still a lot of work to do. Like we don't have any country <laughs> that is doing enough on climate change, but you can see the difference when those decisions are made in a more um, just and equitable way. And again, like I need to reiterate that when we're talking about youth, we need to ensure that we're talking about the intersectional aspects of it and not only, you know, like a checkbox of youth. Like we need to make sure that we're including our local communities and our indigenous people as part of that youth and also interest and partner. So yes, I think like um, we need political will to um, respect and elevate those views and also support them. So yeah, that's what I would say. All right, um, yeah, thank you. I guess I'm rounding it out here. Um, best for last, just kidding, we're all great. Um, but I think there's a couple of things that I can bring up now. One is, you know, today again, I was participating in the Youth Skills Day, right? And something that we learned and that was talked about today was that there's like, you know, a quarter of the world's population is young people, but you know, how many young people do we see in government? Like 10. Um, so it's really not, there's no representation, right? But it's not just a young, people is also of women. One of my friends, Renata, gave a really great point earlier by noting that a lot of the governments who do include more young girls and women in their decision-making processes are also the ones that are achieving these sustainable development goals and, you know, goals to reduce climate change emissions, but also an adaptation. So it's not just about, you know, young people here and there, as Asatis was just mentioning, it's really intentionally engaging our different intersectionalities of young people and uplifting every single person, all of our different needs, identities, and experiences, because we all have something unique to bring to the table. And we need to, you know, be making sure that we are trying to increase our representation. And maybe just as an example, I know this is like North America, uh, mostly I don't know how many of us are from different countries across North America, but I'm in the US and I know I don't really see you know, myself or other people really represented like me in government that often. So I just love to see who feels like your government represents them really well. Mm. 
Yeah, no one. Uh, you can't see the audience on Zoom. I don't know if you can, but nobody raised their hand. I don't know if the Zoom people did, but I think that's not surprising. It's sad and it's frustrating, but it's not surprising. So I think that leads me to what can we be doing, right? I think there's scales of action. You have the biggest scale, right, at the international level. It's including more young people and people with different identities in these decision-making spaces as decision makers, not as, yeah, congrats, we brought someone to follow me around at the conference, right? And then we also had you know, that conference level where everyone's saying we don't need more and more conferences that don't accomplish things. But these are really great spaces because that's where change can happen and can start the conversations and connections that we need that can inspire people to actually act eventually. Maybe it's not gonna happen right then and the commitment is always hard to get done, but these spaces do create really great connections where people who are acting, like all of us here, can come together to see how we can partner on that. And then we have our national level, right? At the national level, there's different policies that you take from the international level to implement. And we can, of course, try to influence those by talking to, in the US, at least your Congress people, not that they listen to you all the time, but you can really try and rally and you know try to use your rights that you do have in your country. For instance, in the US, we do have the right to protest, fortunately. So those have been proven to be successful in other social movements and are things that we can still take advantage of. Then you have your state and local level, which you can do the same thing. But something unique about the local level is a lot of times you do have better access to actually having your voice heard. You can go to city council meetings and share your opinions, you can email your representatives in government. Like if someone emails me, I always answer. My office is really good about making sure that we are including people at any and all aspects of time and making sure that we're addressing their needs. And then you also have at the individual level, right? So you have these different skills. Individually, right, we can research, educate ourselves. You can also take your education and transform it and share it with your community and your schools. I know I was fortunate enough to learn about climate change in high school but nobody else in Texas, not really surprised that it's Texas, right? That's <laughs> where I'm from, didn't learn about climate education because I got to go to a really cool global citizenship school. So I was telling all of my friends about climate change and at the time they were like, oh, this doesn't matter. Uh, but now suddenly they're all asking me, oh, what can I do now? And so it feels good to be that person that my friends can go to to ask more questions. So letting your friends and family and community members know and trying to spread this knowledge to other people I think it's really, really important thing you can do individually, especially when we're talking about climate adaptation and trying to make sure that we're meeting all of our needs. So I think it comes down to a lot of things, scales of action, getting involved where you feel comfortable. And when you do that, make sure you're taking care of yourself as well, because that's also a big part of dealing with the climate crisis is taking care of yourself first and foremost. So that's all I have to say. Just want to say thank you so much to Peace Boat and GCA for having me and us and convening this session. I look forward to staying in touch with anyone. And yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Haley, Isatis, and Alyssa. It's just been so inspiring to hear all of your words. And I definitely agree that these conferences are very important for galvanizing momentum and building partnership for you know, those uh, solutions that we're seeking to create. We know that we need everybody at the table and they happen at these international conferences. And it also gave us the space to have all of you here today. If the UN HLPF wasn't happening at this moment, it wouldn't be maybe as relevant having this youth forum at this time on Youth Skills Day. But these conferences are also an opportunity to bring everyone together when everybody's coming to the same reason, to the same purpose of being at these conferences, we can really find more solutions. And I think also what Haley mentioned of, you know, kind of being the ambassador and having people come look to you. We have with us Blue Planet Alliance Global Ambassadors. We have with us here Global Kids. We have the Peace Boat US Interns, Sustainable Ocean Alliance Youth. We have youth from all these different organizations. And it's amazing that you are here because the knowledge that you gain, this wealth of information is something that you can then go and share with your communities. So that's what we really hope to do, especially at Peace Boat. We try to be a platform for knowledge sharing and education. So really excited to be working with all of you here today. So thank you so much. One more round of applause for this beautiful panel. All right, so before we welcome our next speakers, we'd love to start with a video message uh, from Mr. Chris Ayale. He's from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and he was a Youth Adapt winner in 2021 and an inspiring example of youth entrepreneurship for adaptation. The Youth Adaptation Solutions Challenge, known as Youth Adapt, is an annual competition and awards program for youth-led enterprises jointly organized by the Global Center on Adaptation, 
and the African Development Bank as part of the African Adaptation Acceleration Program. And this is a flagship program, Youth Adapt. The competition invites young entrepreneurs and micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in Africa to submit innovative solutions on climate adaptation and resilience. The winners of the 2021 Youth Adapt Solutions Challenge were unveiled at the COP26, which is the UN Climate Change Conference, 26th ceremony at the African Pavilion in Glasgow. So we're gonna pull up here our partners from Zoom to show us a little bit about this video that we can uh, watch here on the screen with a message from Mr. Chris Ayale. Chris Ayale of Kivu Green Corporation in Congo. Based in Congo, Kivu Green is a web mobile and SMS USSD platform that helps farmers decide when and how to plant crops, and how to select the best seeds for a given location, using climate and weather data. It also connects producers to available markets and agricultural information, market price, agricultural weather and advice on agricultural technical routes in the face of climate change. Everybody. Well, that was a very short interlude video uh, from Chris Alaya about his project, but let's give it a round of applause as a winner of the Youth Adapt Factors program. Congratulations. That's really inspiring to see youth from the DRC taking the lead in innovation and solutions for climate adaptation. And as we know, Africa is one of the regions most affected by the impacts of climate change. And this will be a strong theme at the UN Climate Change Conference coming up in Egypt this next November. So we're looking forward to learning more and partnering with youth organizations that are working um, on all of these issues, especially from the African region. So with that, our next um, inspiring panel that's coming up is going to be focusing a little bit uh, here on the situation in North America. And we'd like to introduce our panelists today. We have a variety of experience on this panel. We have four panelists, including one virtual participant. So first, I'd like to start with Ms. Disa Croci, who's from the Sika Nation, Canada. She is co-founder of 7Gen, an Indigenous Youth Council committed to a sustainable and equitable energy future. We have together Ms. Natalia Mack, a rising senior at Notre Dame School in Manhattan, also a member of Global Kids Human Rights Activist Project. So Disa, if you'd like to come to the front, and Natalia, if you'd like to come have a seat, give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. We also have Ms. Alejandra Gutierrez Rodriguez, who is the Division Coordinator for Strategic Partnerships, Partnerships and Partnerships and Advocates and Advocates. Alejandra. And we have with us online joining in by Zoom, Zoom is Angelica Shamerina, the Climate Change Program Advisor to UNDP, GEF, and Small Grants Program. Everybody welcome. Welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Angelica, for joining us. Great. So we're going to start this panel and we will ask each of you to go to the mic as well. And um, first to just share a little bit about yourself. You can introduce yourself and your project. And we have two key questions that we'd like to focus on in this panel. So we'll start with the first one, which is, can you share the innovative youth-led solutions you are implementing in your country and what are the lessons learned? So we'll start. You can also include your introduction there and tell us a little bit more about your work because you are all leading really incredible solutions for your community. So Disa, we would like to start with you if you'd like to come up to the front. Everybody give Disa a warm welcome. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm just doing it because I got some, it's the non Um. Okay, so um, um, I'm from Sixth Nation, which is uh, one of four tribes that make up the Blackfoot Confederacy in Canada and into Montana. The other three are Bigani Yagena and Amiskapi Bigani. I'm very honored and thankful to be in this space with everyone. Um, and before I start, I just want to also acknowledge the people who haven't made it into this space, the children, these voices that we're all representing, the people and the issues that we all care about. Um, they always have a seat and spot in these spaces. 
Um, and a little bit about myself. Um, in 2017, I co-founded an, an, an energy summit called Seven Gen, um, where we hosted uh, the gathering in 2019. We brought together 200 Indigenous participants from across Canada. Um, it was the first gathering of its kind that was for Indigenous people by Indigenous people, because I fortunately had the opportunity to attend um, a whole bunch of gatherings, um, conferences and workshops uh, throughout my education. And um, I was always, I always felt like I was either not represented well or um, youth, youth didn't really have a space to make change in those spaces. Um, so I wanted to host a gathering that filled those gaps and, and made my people and other young women and young men um, feel safe and empowered. Um, the gathering was built around a motto I learned from the Center for Affordable Water and Sanitation Technology, which is to educate, engage, and empower. Um, and currently I am the team and project lead for a solar greenhouse project in Sisiba, where we want to partner with a local um, school in our community um, on, on maintaining um, a greenhouse and having the opportunity to just learn how to grow food themselves and, and be a little bit more sovereign. Um, it's very hard for our people to have access to healthy food um, and even just have uh, access to education around renewable energy, um, water, um, and all of that. Um, and I am also currently working as a community researcher with the University of Calgary. So they're helping support some of the projects that I'm working on and Southern Gen. Um, and everything has life around us. It is always important to evolve our perspective and our egos um, instead of looking at our environment as, as human beings being the top of the food chain. It's important to remember that that life around us isn't, a, isn't all around us and we're not the center of the environment, we're a part of that environment. Um, and as an indigenous person, we, we have a saying, we also like to all my relations, but that's not just to the people that we're blood related to, that's to every single person in this room and all the resources around us. When <laughs> we don't really even refer to them as natural resources, those are our relations. Um, they give so much more to us than we give to them um, and the environment around us. Um, helping others has always been my motivation to better myself as an individual. It is very re rewarding when I have the opportunity to spread good energy. Um, and I am passionate about innovating and advocating for environmental and humanitarian rights from an Indigenous per perspective. Um, these values have shaped me into who I am and what I want to pursue in life. Um, my story started from, from a very young age, I, I knew what was around me, what was happening around me, and as young people, we, are all, we all have that in common, where we know what is affecting us, how it's affecting us, and the solutions that um, we want to implement, um, and it's up to government and um, organizations to not only allow us to come into these spaces, but to work with us and to hire Indigenous people and young people. Um, I think it's important to also remember that Canada and America are very young countries. We have clothing and furniture older than our countries. And so a lot of the stuff that we're working on, um, they're the first of their kind. They're developing um, at a very fast rate, but also it's very new. Um, to these systems because these systems weren't built on, on inclusion of women and children and people of color. Um, and um, from an indigenous person, um, our communities are going to be the first people that experience the effects of climate change. Um, we not only will experience them first, but we are significantly underfunded 
um, and our departments that take care of our um, patients are significantly understaffed. Um, and an effect of climate change that I can um, bring up is in 2013, there was a massive flood um, where I'm from and it displaced a lot of families. And still to this day, people are finally getting back into homes. Um, and, and, and a lot of that had to do with just how fast we were able to um, get the processes going of getting these people their homes. Um, but yeah, so a lot of um, what I talk about is um, centered around decolonization and our perspectives of how we treat each other and the environment around us. Um, I think it's important to, to not only remember that, yes, we have a lot to learn, we communicate with each other, but we also have a lot to unlearn. Um, and we have perspectives that we've unintentionally taken on that aren't our own. Um, and it's important to focus on balance because if you don't have proper balance, um, like in different areas, then, and that, that's different for everyone. Everyone has a different balance of what you can give um, to the projects and give your energy into. Um, and I feel like the focus should be less on um, blaming climate change on the ind individual and individual families, but on creating um, pressure on policy change makers and, and industry um, uh, leaders, because that's where the most, of, most pollution is coming from. Um, and even that, our communities, um, our indigenous communities are affected by that as well, because there's routes for pipelines that are suggested that will run through um, communities that are off uh, reserve land or off unceded traditional territories, um, but they're not approved because they go through these communities. So they're rerouted into um, indigenous communities because they're considered less important. Um, and those products are being forced and moved to move forward. Um, and not only that, but our traditional territories um, where we hold ceremonies, where we harvest, where we have, um, where we have um, traditional um, burial grounds, those things are being disrupted um, because we're not being considered people still. Um, and so, um, and so it's just important to listen to indigenous youth, especially um, a lot of a lot of our traditional values um, come from the relationships with the environment around us, the animals, the plants, the insects, um, and the way that we think about life is we don't think in a linear um, format or fashion. We think of everything in this cycle, and we think about whatever ha whatever we decide and we put forward today affects um, the generations ahead of us. And that's where Seven Gen came from, um, where we wanted to um, acknowledge the truth that every single one of us in this room and in this space and who are, uh, everyone uh, everywhere, we are all future ancestors. And what that means is that it's important to speak about what's in, what impacts all of our communities. Um, and that's all I'll share for now. And we, thank you. Thank you, Disa. Thank you for being here. It's so important for us also to always include the voices of Indigenous communities and looking at traditional knowledge and how we can carry that forward. So really value your message and thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and this panel has a very diverse group here. So next, I'd like to welcome up Alejandro Gutierrez from Mexico. My World Mexico is one of our partners who has been working with Peace Boat whenever we dock in the ports of Puerto Vallarta or Cancun or other areas of Mexico. We're working with this group, working towards the SDGs. So everybody welcome Alejandra. Hey everyone, how are you? A little bit tired? Don't worry, I'm, I'm also very tired, so it's okay. So um, first, I'm Alejandro Gutierrez, you can call me Ale, if it's easier for you. 
I am the strategic partnerships and advocacy division coordinator at Maru Mexico. And this is an organization where we put sustainable development, the 2030 agenda and the SDGs at the local, national, and even regional level, because we also work on different countries in the Latin America region. Okay, so because of this, we work mostly with a lot of young people. Most of our team is made of young people and other vulnerable groups. And we have impacted over 10,000 million people across the world with our actions. And we do this through different programs. One of this is the Accelerators program where we work with ambassadors, mostly young people and organizations from all sectors because we believe in a multi-sectorial um, way of engagement and partnerships because we can do this together. We can do this together. We can change, but only if it's a multi-stakeholder and multi-generational um, approach. We also have a different uh, program that's called campaigns where we each month mobilize people across uh, Mexico and other countries where we inspire them and mobilize them on certain topics to take action and uh, move their communities to create change. Uh, le just last month in June, we made this um, SDG 14 campaign uh, called Revitaliza los Oceanos, Revitalize Your Oceans where we organized uh, different uh, beach cleanings across the Mexican Republic, um, other um, water bodies and everything. So, you know, we are actually doing something to change and just go farther than just uh, speeches and talk about what needs to be done. But we are also inspiring other people to take that action into their own communities because really it's just us who can take a change so that other other actors can be inspired to also follow them they, uh, to be other actors that have the resources we have the ideas we have the good practices they can help us so we we empower them through these different programs that i was talking to you about i'm just mentioning two because i don't want to take most of the time but um and on the question of which are the main priorities uh, for youth-led solutions, for me, three things are key. First, young people, we need funding. Like I said, we have a lot of good ideas, but in the end, to implement them is, um, is a privilege. Not everyone has the resources, the financial resources to make a change, to create a program that will do something. So financial resources, and funding is one of the key aspects for our youth -led solutions. Another one is, and I was already mentioning it, is uh, multi-sectorial and intergenerational partnerships, because we can't do this alone. We, we really can't. We need of the others, of what everyone can do best. And lastly, an active participation that actually has impact. Because um, across this year's, I've been, uh, I've been a, a festival. Uh, celebration. Yeah, I've been a witness of how young people are participating more and more at the decision tables and in international forums like the HLPF. But still, we are just there as participants. We are not heard, and sometimes our um, our ideas don't make a change. So we have to also create a mechanism so that we can have a real impact and not just be there, but also be heard and have an active participation. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave you with that. Um, so if you have any questions, just come to me. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. And part of this forum is to make sure that your voices are heard. That's exactly why we're here today, to make sure youth voices are included and part of this global agenda for adaptation. So thank you so much. And next, I would like to invite up Ms. Natalia Mack, who again is from Global Kids and here representing many of the youth here in the audience. Everybody, welcome, Natalia. Today, I'm representing Global Kids, an organization that educates and inspires youth from communities all over New York to take critical action on global, kid, um, global issues. 
um, while the floor became some student-led activities and their books, organizing action projects such as a park cleanup in Central Park and creating care packages for women, for women, um, sustainable menstrual products and giving them to a women's health shelter. Um, because we've seen the effects that um, climate change has had on those communities and also how some sustainable products are not accessible to certain communities. Um, some decisions, some things that are integral to like making sure that these student-led activities are um, going through are um, having a diversity within the decision-making and knowing that diversity plays a role in determining the unique representation felt by different people and places, and in doing so by not working being inclusive to everyone involved. We also strive to make the decision to benefit others, not only from our own um, personal perspective, but from other perspectives. And keep in mind that in an international context, we must all, um, we must keep an eye on all social and economic situations. Um, Thank you, Natalia. And I hope that all of the youth here from Global Kids will be able to interact with these other organizations and, and build that network because you guys are really the present and the future, especially in the high schools that are making that difference with the after school programs at Global Kids. So thank you so much. Big round of applause for the organization and for Natalia. Thank you. All right, next I would like to invite up Angelica, who is online with us, um, again from UNDP in the Small Grants Program. Angelica, I know you also have some slides there, so I'll let you all. Adjust and we have you on the screen. Yes, I will uh, share some slides. First of all, I apologize. I was looking forward to being in person uh, with you. Unfortunately, I got sick with COVID as it happens. So I'm um, sorry, and I have to do Zoom this time. But um, I will try to share screen now. Um, just bear with me for a second. Hmm. I don't know why it doesn't let me show a window. Uh -huh. I think it should work now. Um, um, I hope you can see it now and you can hear me well. Um, I work in a UNDP uh, implemented program. Uh, it's called Small Grants Program. It's basically a grants program that um, gives direct access to funding from Global Environment Facility for environmental projects to, um, to the people from developing countries um, and um, for environmental projects. So it's a number of environmental projects with adaptation mainstream through and some also dealing with mitigation, introduction of decarbonization, introduction of renewable energy. Out of North America, we only have Mexico among those countries. However, I think I will speak of a couple of lessons that I think are um, adaptable and applicable across and applicable also to North American youth. Um, so the first I think important lesson that we learned in our program where youth is a priority group is to actually earmark or um, insist on part of the funding um, being available for youth. Because if not, it's very easy to lose sort of youth among other groups. And um, in our case, um, we worked consciously to increase the share of the projects led by youth, um, earmarking funds for that. And in our case, um, the, we track the, the youth-led projects and we found that uh, since 2015, that share grew to over 40% of all our projects, which have youth participants or youth leaders, uh, youth-led organizations. So I think it's very important. The other important component of that is that we have um, a youth focal point in the steering committees of the countries. Uh, most of the countries, 74% of the countries, three quarters have um, uh, a youth focal point appointed. Uh, and that's also very important because these steering committees make decisions on the, grants, uh, on the ground and those are 
um, and those people sitting on those steering committees representing youth are making uh, youth a priority, making this happen. So, um, so I think that's the first and then the first applicable lesson for the governments and local governments in North America is to focus on youth specifically rather than especially in the funding that they give, especially um, youth-led enterprises, youth-led initiatives, and to earmark money for that. And I don't know, I, I don't believe many, may, I don't believe everybody does that, but that's maybe something to be considered. And um, you can see also the approach, our approach to youth programming. Um, in addition to this earmarking through the program, we, we actually have a special initiative um, which, um, in which 11 countries participating with the green jobs for youth, uh, for young generation, and also um, building up youth skills to lead climate action. So that's more on awareness and empowerment, but green jobs is one important point uh, for us. So in addition to empowerment, you also have to think of how young people are going to survive and live and build their careers. And that applies both to North America and to Global South, to all the countries. The activities may be different, but young people need to study, gain skills, and build their careers. So the focus of green jobs, I believe, is one very important focus that has to be part of the policies uh, on local and regional level in, um, in all regions. If we want to, if we are really serious about climate change adaptation, Unfortunately, due to current geopolitical situation, as you may know, there's been a major backsliding on mitigation, unfortunately, and we don't know when it will end. So adaptation becomes even more urgent, um, especially for, and the young people have to be prepared for those jobs. Um, so I think very important, um, that aspect is very important. And I wanted to, I will share a couple of examples of what we, of the uh, initiatives we funded in middle-income countries that are closer to what, to the situation of North America. Um, we also supported global youth video competition, that is participation of youth in global fora, such as COPS, actually with Adriana, we worked on that. And I also provided the link to the publication, which you can have in this presentation. I shared it with organizers. Um, that may be of interest for you, different examples of young people's initiatives around the world that may inspire you um, as well um, to, to, to see, to look for, for similar initiatives, uh, um, for similar initiatives in, in your country. Uh, so you can have this as a resource as well. And I wanted very briefly to share a couple of, a couple of interesting examples. One is from Dominican Republic. Um, there is a, there was a, we worked in a community which um, lacked job prospects and such communities do exist also in, in North America, as we all know, um, where youth lacked opportunities and skills. Um, many young people are unemployed and practice unsustainable use of natural resources, um, including they were lacking access to safe water. Um, our project supported the development of rural enterprises led by young women and using sustainable production practices and solar energy. And as a result, um, the, there were several enterprises created and also the project tested the training model for rural entrepreneurs, specifically targeting youth um, and teaching them sustainable practices and adaptive approaches in food production so that they can start a more sustainable rural enterprises and, and also um, get income from that. Um, in Algeria, um, similar project with Rural Youth Association that started growing organic produce for export, again, using sustainable practice, practices, organic techniques, and also preserving a site which is uh, very important because it's next to uh, internationally recognized Ramsar wetland site. So we have a number of projects like that. That could be something also interesting, supporting youth entrepreneurship and giving youth uh, tools to create those enterprises, especially in rural areas where youth doesn't have so many prospects. Another example in empowerment and training I have from Bahamas, um, Jamaica, Armenia, and their approaches to create 
um, education centers based on existing educational institutions, universities, to create education centers on um, the, the technologies and methodologies on mitigation adaptation, renewable energy, also um, renewable engineers. There is a, a deficit of such specialists in many countries and there's a bottleneck on applying such technologies. So teaching people and teaching also sustainable agriculture techniques and others. Um, basically same approaches I even used in the countries that are much poorer than that, of course. Uh, in Africa and other places, those technologies are different, but the approach is the same. I think it's very important for young people to advocate and to think of how systematically the government um, can support and also perhaps foundations can support youth entrepreneurship and youth skills in dealing with adaptation beyond advocacy, which advocacy is very important, but how do we practically support youth in implementing those adaptation activities. So these are the points I wanted to make today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Angelica. I hope you can hear everybody clapping here from the room. It's really great to hear about your experience and expertise, especially coming from UNDP and the small grants program, as we just talked about how we need funding for these projects so many this can be a link for all of you to uh, research a little bit more and find the funding that you need for those programs. So thank well, you so much. We developing we countries. One last but, <laughs> sorry, I, I wanted to say that we fund developing countries. Um, however, it's also important to get, in, except Mexico is part of North America. However, I think it's important to also advocate in the same as New York City or others have funds for funding local businesses. Do they have use? Do they have environmental? I know they have some. I know I, I follow local local situation, but many don't. And why not advocate for that in Canada and also in the United States? Absolutely, thank you very much. I agree, we need to advocate for more funding all around. I think that that's one of the biggest challenges this year in looking at climate change is how can we fund all the solutions that we're coming up with? So that's. An important part, we have some friends here from ESG as well, so we'll have to introduce yeah, some of our partners later on. We'll have to have some networking going on so you guys can also connect. Excellent. Um, well, I have one more question for the panel uh, briefly. If any of you would like to share any particular order, um, or we can start from one side and move across, um, to speak a little bit more about what are the main priorities for youth-led solutions to be sustainable and scalable? I think funding is one of those, you know, challenges, but it's also a priority. But do you want to um, start? Maybe we can start with Alejandra, and then we can move across towards Disa. That'd be great. What are the main priorities for youth-led solutions to be sustainable and scalable? Thank you. Well, um, basically, I told you like the three key aspects for me: funding, my um, like people believing in us is also another one because. Um, not a, as young people, a lot of others, especially adults, see us as inexperienced, and this is something that um, a lot of young people are also aware of. Like sometimes we have the experience, we have the knowledge, but we don't have the opportunities. So one of the aspects is, and for it to be sustainable in the future, is to also include us since the beginning, since the pro since the process starts. Because we actually are going to be the ones that in the future are going to manage that, are going to make uh, run things down. I don't know how to explain it exactly in English, but um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, in my first uh, intervention, I also mentioned the other key points for it to be, uh, the, the other priorities for it to be sustainable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. And Natalia, would you like to go next? What do you think are some of the key priorities for youth solutions to be sustainable and scalable? Um, I think for scalability, reaching out to youth using social media because a lot of um, young people um, utilize social media a lot. So I feel like when you reach out to them that way, it's more um, commendable. Also, it won't be like locally, it would be globally because social media is vast and also just maintaining their interest through the fun activities and 
um, and that they want to be listening to their ideas and not being dismissive. Um, so, 7 Gen um, started because we wanted to bring hope to Indigenous communities across Canada. Um, there are so many different and beautiful cultures and practices across Canada, um, but we do have certain um, aspects and stuff in common. Um, so, uh, um, the 7 Gen team um, was hosted out of a chapter um, within the Mount Royal University. Um, and we've had we've had the fortunate opportunity to work with indigenous people um, from different uh, um, communities across Canada. Um, but while we were planning, we realized just we already kind of knew that, but we also just like we confirmed it that not one of us could mention um, one community in Canada that had full access to clean drinking water. Um, and um, how that how that affects us and our families. Um, another thing that we have in common is that, which was one of the main, also the main drivers, um, to just have um, to have and give access to, to water education and energy education in the indigenous communities, is that um, the way that I, I started seeing um, what environmental work was and is um, because of the, of the lack of opportunities out there. Um, and I, I thought of it as a very stuffy kind of like environment and field to work in and exist in. Um, but I started learning about my culture a lot more. Um, and I started learning about what my ancestors did and what they represented and the balance that they instilled in our communities. Um, but going back to what I mentioned before of how, um, of how, we have certain things that we all um, have in common um, among our cultures is that mental health is also a, a really big struggle. Um, and when we were working on 7 Gen, um, one of the main drivers is that, um, and what we all had in common, is that we attend more funerals than we do weddings or graduation. Um, the stuff that we have access to and the food and water, um, and not a lot of times we're, we're, we're putting like good stuff into our bodies. And, and so I, I, there's a lot of mental health issues um, and that, that goes back to um, what we have to go through with residential schools. Um, also, a lot of us are first generation out of um, those systems. I'm first generation and my youngest sibling is two years old. Um, we're all the first generation out of that system. And that system was a direct practice of um, colonization and assimilation of indigenous people and our cultures. And in that process, we wanted to bring that up because in that process, we didn't only, um, they didn't only try to get rid of us as people, but our practices as well. Um, uh, and one of the other speakers who mentioned um, um, what the climate, um, impacts are having on our land. Um, sorry, I'm trying to remember what she was, um, what she was um, saying, but we used to do traditional like burnings of the land um, to help, to help um, the land and um, the growing practices. Um, but a lot of that was stopped. So we're having a lot more floods, we're having a lot more fires. Um, and a lot of stuff that we did, we knew um, how to have a relationship with the environment around us. We knew what area needed what um, and how to respect it and how to have a proper relationship with that. And so Indigenous people, but also young people, we know about all these things. And um, it's important to remember um, to not just involve them, but to hire them in your projects and in your companies. And not just that, but to offer trainings to young people as, as low as um, elementary school into high school, offer them, offer them your knowledge and, um, and yeah, and, and funding is also a really big help, but even to um, high school students um, that want to have projects that want to influence um, their communities in a positive way. Um, 
And also it's important to remember that no matter like how old you are, how young you are, um, that to humanize your work. Uh, we're in this space, not just because we're angry and we're frustrated, but that anger and frustration comes from love and from a want and need to have a better quality of life for our families and our communities. Um, and, um, and then that will sometimes be, that will sometimes involve being uncomfortable in, in these situations when you're a speaker or when you're trying to network because that can be really heavy and exhausting. Um, but we have to be uncomfortable in order to be comfortable. And especially when you're in the process of influencing change, because as youth, we also realize that we really want to accelerate it at a lot, of, at a very fast uh, rate. Um, because we, when you're working in this area and you're learning more about um, environmental impacts, um, negative impacts, it's very heavy and it's very depressing when you think about, you think about these, the time frame that we have to do, um, to put out good. Um, it can be very, very heavy and it can be very intimidating to work with governments, policy change makers, um, organizations. It can be very confusing. Um, and you, so, and the more you get to know one area, the more it branches out and you realize there's a problem here, there's a problem over there. Um, and it just keeps going and going and going. So it's very overwhelming. Um, and just know that you're not alone in feeling that, that your frustration is valid and justified. Um, you're allowed to be, to care. You're allowed to be loud and you're allowed to um, give space to yourself to just pause. Um, and want to do your part. Something that helps me navigate through all of that as an Indigenous person um, is actually a quote from Lynn manuel Miranda, which I want to leave you with. Um, um, if it's, if it's, there's one thing that you should take away um, from every speaker and from every um, um, presentation um, is just don't, don't pressure yourself to remember everything. Um, and take away one thing that you can kind of build from. So the quote from um, him was, um, you cannot let all the world's tragedies into your heart will drown, but the ones you do let in should count, let them manifest action. And, and it's important to me to be in the space to talk to young people as well and to acknowledge um, where we are coming from um, and to the people that that are policy decision makers and the heads of these organizations and these gatherings to offer trainings and, and mentorship to youth. Um, and that's how you make it sustainable. Don't just invite us into these spaces and then what are we gonna hear about afterwards? Afterwards, what is the change going to be and where is it gonna come from and when's it gonna start? We need to have um, a mentorship like um, programs put in place where you're you're educating youth, but you're also learning from them. Um, you're learning from their stories, um, where they're coming from, where their families are coming from. Um, and then um, making systems that aren't just very singular and, and linear, um, making it so that there's always room for change because the environment is always going to be changing. Um, especially our governments are constantly changing. So, um, yeah, so just um, have more seats at the table for Indigenous people, for young people, um, and even at going as far back as to consult consultations um, for every level of project um, and policy that is going to be happening and affecting us. You should always be at the table um, as a Black person. Um, our cult in our culture, traditionally wise, we always have youth at every ceremony, at every meeting. Um, they always have a seat at the table. They're not separated. They're not left out because this is going to be affecting them. But also they have so much more to offer um, than, um, yeah, and um, yeah. where um, you have so much education on your plate um, and under your belt, you still will have to learn as you go. You still have to be out there and, and doing that. 
um, but you're never alone in that process. You're allowed to want change and demand change um, and know that there are people out there that support you and that are there for you. And really quickly, um, Student Energy and Indigenous Clean Energy are organizations that are based in Canada that support Indigenous communities and projects. Um, and so they both have websites and 37 Gen website as well. So if you want to get in contact with me or the team or those organizations and support them financially or just get to know them and want to be part of a network of um, individuals that will give you a safe space to um, be who you are and have the questions and also just um, support you um, those are there and um, thank you to the organizers of the event of organizing this whole thing giving your energy to us um, and I hope that you all travel home and speak thank you so much Lisa for those really inspiring words for our youth and I love that idea of thinking that you are never alone but you are always allowed to change and adapt to your environment and to come up with new innovative ideas because that's the climate we're living in right it's time for us to find new solutions and that's going to come from all of you here in this room so thank you for inspiring us all um and angelica did you have any last words that you wanted to add from um from online yes very um i very much agree with the previous speaker i think the training mentorship and job creation are key um, because um, uh, it's not just policies that are activities, but it's actually everyday work in adapting. How do we change our business practices? How do we create these new businesses, new jobs uh, to adapt to climate change? That includes agriculture, that includes everything, the city planning um, and everything. So young people have to be able to fully participate and fully take advantage of those jobs. So yes, mentorship, um, training, education, dedicated funding and creation and help to um, youth-led businesses. Yes. Thank you, Angelica. One more round of applause, everybody, for this closing panel. Thank you so much. And next, uh, we'd like to invite our panelists who can have a seat here. We're going to do a little bit of an interactive section with you all for this afternoon. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left of our entire afternoon presentation. So we're just going to take about five or 10 minutes for this interactive exercise, which we'll be asking all of you to join us both online and everybody here in the room. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of design thinking for climate resilience in North America post 2030. So we'd like you to imagine what would a climate resilient North America look like post 2030? and identify five actions that can enable the transformational change at the regional level and share the priorities for the global goal on adaptation. So we have some guiding questions here projected on the screen. And for those of you joining via Zoom, you can also add your comments through Mentimeter, which will create a word cloud. Has anybody here used Mentimeter before in some of your classrooms or after school activities? Okay, great. Well, this is gonna be an online program, but we're also gonna invite those of you who are in the room and would like to share your voice to come up to the microphone and join us here in person. So we're giving about 20 seconds. I'm gonna be the timekeeper, 20 to 30 seconds per person who would like to share your ideas. And we'd ask you to come up to the front and those of you who are online or in the room that wanna do this virtually as well, go to menti.com and add in the code that's on the top right, 476-41247. And with that, we will start our word cloud. So we'll start here also in the room. I know we have SOA, we have other global kids, we have Reverse the Trend, we have lots of organizations here. We have our Facebook US interns. Raise your hand if you'd like to come up also and give a quick 20 second message. Yes, Lisa, also feel free to join us. Look, we got a few words up here already. All right, also just really quickly, um, we're hosting the second 7 Gen um, in September in, Sas in Saskatchewan, in Canada. Um, yeah, so uh, I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> Maybe we can add here, what does a climate resilient North America post 2030 look like? I would say with indigenous culture, can we add that up there, Disa, as part of our solutions and our things that we want to see more indigenous culture and language? Anybody else? Yes, yeah, Sophia, please come on up. I'd love to have a line of people up here. You get 20 seconds each, so you guys don't be shy. Blue Planet Global Ambassadors, come on up. Hello, I'm Sophia from Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, the words I think of are resilience and blue carbon. Um, so 
investing in blue carbon, which will help us sequester CO2 and also make for more res resilient um, coasts, uh, protecting against storm surge and sea level rise by having that natural barrier. So blue carbon and resilience. This is open mic. You guys have three to four more minutes here. So I'd love to have a few more people come on up. Anybody's welcome from the audience. You can just share with us, what does a post 2030 climate resilient North America look like? What are you dreaming of? What would be your ideal New York City? What would be your ideal climate? This is your chance to come and share with us up here on the stage. Yes, Alyssa, come on up. Uh, what climate resilient North America would look creative because everyone would be working together to make various solutions to the issues we have today. And many of these issues do require creative solutions, so it would be creative. Thank you, Alyssa, Blue Planet Alliance Global Ambassador here. What about the peaceful U.S. interns? I see Vivian, Ayesha, Arpita. Think of some words. You can throw out any words you like to come on up to the front and share with us. Anybody else here from Global Kids? We have lots of you from the audience. Anybody else want to come up and share? We have about three minutes left. All right. Michael Scanlon, all right. Give Michael a round of applause. Right. The Resilient 2030 means that no one has a throwaway single-use water bottle anymore. Nobody does, because nine out of 10 land in the ocean as crap. We know that, nine out of 10 single-use water bottles. But even those water bottles back there, it's like that, shouldn't go in the garbage can, they should go into a waste stream that recycles. So recycling, reusing, repurposing, redeveloping is part of our culture and life. And One World is also here to help that process happen. Nice to be here, thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. Yes, we're so excited to connect with One World. All right, Peace Love US interns, we have Vivian, thank you. Um, something that sounds to me like a resilient or climate resilient future would be something around uh, clean food and clean um, just access to resources. I've noticed a lot in like grocery stores and stuff like that, a lot of things are packaged in plastic, which obviously ends up in landfills and there's no biodegradability in that, but there are other options like uh, cardboard, egg cartons and stuff like that. And I feel like we could probably implement that and influence that as being a part of our everyday shopping experience more often. Thank you. I'd like to say one or two more. We have Matt here in the back, one of our Peace Boat US interns. Thank you. Also, Joseph, if you want to add anything from your experience, you guys are all welcome to come up and leave your, leave your voices here. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Something I was just thinking about um, that I saw last week, I was talking to my grandfather move into a new apartment complex. Um, and one thing that they were always talk talking a lot about was electric cars and how a lot of older buildings don't have the electrical grid capacity to charge electric cars, um, making it very difficult to actually make them usable. And really think about kind of how one thing that we desperately need to kind of be prepared for climate change is a much stronger electrical grid. Um, we saw um, two years ago in Texas, I think when it was last year, with the heavy winter storms that completely knocked out power in the state. Um, you know, in California, a lot of wildfires are started by faulty electrical lines because they're so old and desperately need to be replaced. Um, and that kind of whole area will allow us to facilitate a much more resilient um, power grid, which we need to you know, do everything. So. Can I introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kyla from Global Kids. Um, I, I said, I'm saying a safer environment because if we're finding better alternatives, then we're finding better ways to um, distribute things. So then it would be like safer and less air pollution if we're finding like, let's not use like so much gasoline in our cars and things like that. So uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Global Kids. All right. And this is going to be our last speaker for this question. We have one more actually. We have Leticia Parkinson, one of Peace Boat's Ocean and Climate Youth Ambassadors from Trinidad and Tobago. Leticia, welcome. All right, hi. So um, I'm from an island, that's why I thought of the coast. I always think about coastal resilience, and unless you live on the coast, it might not occur to you. Um, there are a lot of things that we could do. I know some people in New York are already working on it with the Illinois Oyster Project. Uh, 
when you have reefs, whether it's coral reefs or oyster reefs, it helps protect your pools from storms. And we're going to see a lot more of that because of climate change. And so when I think about resilience, I'm thinking, you know, we can protect our pools as well. We all here can protect the pools. All right, thank you, Letitia. It's so great to have you here with us. Letitia joined us on board the Peace Boat and traveled with us during our Ocean and Climate Youth Ambassador Program. So it's great to have her in New York. And I hope you all can meet right after this. We're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes. But I think we'd like to go to one last question. Um, and these are the five actions that can enable transformational change in North America. Does anybody want to name an action and add to our next word cloud? We're starting fresh here on the page. So you can be more um, involved. I think I'm going to ask for our pizza to come up. What's one action? And then we're going to have Aisha too. All of our interns are going to come up and share with us. Five actions that can enable a climate resilient word. Again, you can go to Mentimeter and add the code on the top right. Hi, so I'm a Peace Boat intern this year. And I think first action we can take from our home, obviously, using renewable energy as much as we can. Um, we use gas and more electricity. And also this summer, we use so much energy. And that's so, how and yeah, so I think we should use more renewable energy and uh, it's gonna be good for our air. There will be no pollution and also we'll save a lot of energy. Thank you. Hi guys. I was gonna say like searching for sustainability in everyday life. So like picking a net carton that's made out of ca cardboard or like um, buying a water bottle instead of buying um, many like every day. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? This would be our last chance to come up. Yeah, come on up. You guys can make a line up here if anybody else wants to join. We'll have two or three more voices before we wrap up today. Hi everyone, I'm Mohammed from Global Kids. Um, one action I think that will, that will enable us to create a um, climate resilient world is more forms like this because uh, when uh, we're raising awareness is the most important part in creating a climate resilient world. So when we have a more forums and meetings like this um, to raise awareness to the, to the youth uh, of, uh, of this country and many countries around the world, then more, more people will have, um, will have more will to make a change. So that will help us to create a climate resilient world. Thank you. Hi, I'm Valerie, I'm also with Global Kids, and I think it's super important to teach the youth about the climate, to educate them in schools, and to teach them they have the right to protest against harmful laws that are being passed. So, yeah. If we all come to Sustainable Ocean Alliance, I would say investing in ocean renewable energy so we can move away from fossil fuels, as you all mentioned, and also try to reduce ocean acidification so we can have healthier ecosystems and a healthier ocean to help us regulate of our planet. Thank you all. Well, look at this. We have lots of ideas here. And just so everybody knows, these ideas are going directly into the reports and recommendations on the Global Goal on Adaptation. So thank you so much for your recommendations, everyone. A round of applause. This is just one fun and interactive way. We want to really get your ideas out and get you thinking about what we can do on this global goal and adaptation from a youth perspective. So really appreciate your participation. And as we know, this event is now coming to a close. So I would like to invite for our closing words. We are so honored to have with us here, Mr. Luis Elizondo Belden, who is the second secretary of the Economic, Social and Human Rights and Humanitarian Section of the Permanent Mission of Mexico to the United Nations. Mr. Elizondo, without further ado, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I had brought a, a, written, a written speech that allowed me to adapt to the climate and, to the yes, yes. and go uh, unscripted. Uh, I wish to, to thank uh, the Global Center on Adaptation and Peace Boat US uh, for, for this kind of invitation, as well as for organizing the space where we can exchange ideas and best practices, where we can exchange uh, concerns and priorities 
on how best to tackle climate, uh, climate change and how best to protect our, our environment. Uh, now, Mexico holds a very special place in the Western Hemisphere because, as it was mentioned before, we're both North American and Latin American. So we're also a natural bridge uh, uh, throughout the continent. And we're also a special country, uh, I must say, uh, because uh, we are a mega diverse country. Mexico has over 10% of the world's biodiversity and yet it only holds 1.2% of the world's land mass. So uh, that also brings a special, special responsibility to work hard to, uh, to, to keep a, a clean environment, a healthy environment and to protect our biodiversity. But we all know that uh, climate challenges, climate change uh, knows no borders and we need to work together. We need to work together as uh, North America and as the uh, citizens of the world. So I'm very, very inspired to be here and honored to be here uh, uh, today and to listen to all the panelists. Uh, I want to leave you with a message of, uh, that speaks to urgency and partnerships. Uh, this decade, 2020, is crucial to climate change. It's crucial to advancing sustainable development because uh, we are feeling all its impact and risks uh, heavily. And that then speaks to partnerships and the importance of the role that you play. We need you. We need your ideas. We need your commitment. We need uh, your fresh perspectives. I must say, uh, states, governments, uh, we do not have the monopoly on the good ideas. We need everyone to be on the table. And states and governments need your ideas. We need to hear from your priorities and your uh, concerns. Now, um, my habitual line of work is in the human rights field. That's where I normally work. And it's quite timely that, uh, that uh, we hold this meeting because actually this very morning right across the street, Uh, inclusive climate actions. Tisa spoke to us about the importance of indigenous peoples. In fact, indigenous peoples protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. We have much to learn from them, from their traditional knowledge. Uh, we need to also ensure climate action policies that include a gender perspective and a uh, 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 craft these, uh, these, these policies and our responses that are gender inclusive and that are inclusive in so many other ways. So we're having this discussion. It's, 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 uh, it's an emerging discussion, an emerging uh, uh, human rights. There's still a lot to work uh, and to do, but your, your, your discussions and ideas certainly are, are, are very important. And as a Latin American, I must also uh, would like to also highlight and call uh, the uh, Escazú Agreement, which is an agreement uh, 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 that is very advanced. It has been ratified by uh, 13 countries in Latin America, and it sets new standards in access to information related to public information. And that opens new spaces and raises the bar on public participation as well as environmental justice. So these are just a couple of examples to bear in mind and uh, uh, to bring to the conversation. And uh, to conclude, as uh, we were saying uh, during our lunchtime uh, networking uh, 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 exchange, uh, we, have, we have the power. We have the power to change and we have the power to charter a new path towards a more sustainable world, towards a more just world, uh, that we can only do that if we champion it together. So we need your commitment, we need your ideas, we need your exchange and your inputs so that we can move forward. And uh, on that note, I thank you once again. And it's been a real privilege and honor to be part of this space and of this exchange. 
And uh, I wish all of you uh, that travel either near or far a safe travel. And thank you for, for all the exchange that you've had uh, these past days uh, 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 in the framework of the HLPF discussions that we've had. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And thank you for also encouraging this action with the youth. I know that from the permanent missions to the UN, it is their job to be here and to work with civil society and United Nations partners. And it is our job as civil society and NGOs in affiliation with the UN to bring these partnerships together and to bring the voice of youth, indigenous communities, and other sectors to the table. So I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And with that, we have one last video message as we are bridging the gap now from this HLPF, High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, moving towards Climate Week, and then we have COP27 coming up. So that will be the Climate Change Conference taking place in Egypt. And we will conclude this session with a video message from Mr. Amr Essam, representative of the COP27 presidency. So we look forward to having his video message shared with us from our partners online. And shortly after that message, everyone, We'll be asking you to choose your favorite sustainable development goal and to get ready for a group photo. So please stay to the end and we'll take a photo with everyone here. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for patience. I'm just pulling up the video. Distinguished participants, colleagues, friends, and inspiring young people, I'm pleased to speak to you today on behalf of Egypt's incoming presidency of COP27, taking place next November in the city of Sharm el Let me, at the outset, thank and congratulate Global Center on Adaptation. We were thrilled to learn that GCA is putting together a series of youth-focused adaptation dialogues. We are further thrilled that these dialogues is starting from Africa and is being held on the sidelines of the World Water Forum taking place at Dakar, Senegal. Distinguished participants, I'm talking to you after a few weeks from the release of the sixth assessment IPCC Working Group 2 report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerabilities. The message is very clear, and there's an endless list of reasons about why do we need to feel alarmed and deeply concerned. Adverse impacts of climate change are already here and cumulatively increasing in all regions and across all sectors. Africa is among the most affected, including in vital areas such as access to water. Some progress is made on adaptation, but it is furthest from enough. Time is running out, resources mobilized are dismal, and adaptation limits are fast approaching. The bigger picture would be more visible with Working Group 3 in April and many other important engagements, such as the UN Oceans Conference in Lisbon. Sharm el Sheikh is expected to be the cup of implementation. Adaptation should be at the heart of implementation discourse and action. The two years of Glasgow Sharm el Sheikh work program on global goal and adaptation was launched and will go through a series of policy and technical discussions. Many voices are calling for seeing a qualitative accomplishment on the GGA discussion in Sharm el Sheikh before the conclusion of its process in UAE in 2023. We look forward for your valuable engagements, inputs, and submissions on the road towards a GGA that captures your concerns, priorities, and challenges, and showcase the best practices of youth-led global and local resilience solutions. Meanwhile, it is imperative to continue to demand a sufficient, meaningful, accessible, predictable, and balanced climate finance for adaptation. The 50-50 mitigation adaptation climate finance must not be a theoretical construct, and doubling the double should be honored and sustained. 
As COP27 presidency, we commit ourselves to a science-based, balanced, transparent, and inclusive leadership that promotes equitable progress on all fronts and encourages a drive for additional ambition and strengthened resilience. In addition, the momentum created in Glasgow needs to be maintained and geared towards implementation. Our objectives and vision will greatly benefit from the inputs from and engagement with all stakeholders. And as a country with extended commitment to youth empowerment, and as an annual host of the World Youth Forum in the same city of Sharm el Sheikh, we will strive to ensure that youth are at the heart of the conversation. As key contributors to policy planning and implementation, as well as being most affected by the future impact of the decisions we make today. For these reasons, we are very glad that COP26 mandated an annual youth-led forum starting from Sharm el Sheikh in cooperation with Yongo and UFCCC Secretariat. Egypt aspires that this forum and the COP itself provide a conducive environment for you to network, disseminate, impart and receive knowledge, speak up and exert the right level of pressure on governments and all stakeholders. I say this while looking forward to recurrent and dynamic conversations with you before, during and after Sharm el Sheikh. I thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who are planning to go to COP, I'd like to see a raise of hands. How many people here, you or your organization, will be attending the COP27 conference? Okay, I see around 10 to 15 people in this room. So I would love for us all to get together after this while we take the group photo and to plan because we are looking forward to going to Egypt and to making a movement and to really raising the voices and having everybody's opinion included in this global goal for adaptation, especially during the youth forum at COP as well as during the official conference itself. Uh, I will also be organizing our team there and helping to coordinate various events. So I really look forward to speaking with all of you. And thank you one more time to all of our speakers today. One more round of applause. <laughs>